feeding it, that jumps to the front of the line. So update in COPD, update in CHF, those are good. Oh, bone health, up, oh, that just jumped to the front of the line because it is just an area that we have not spent enough attention or time on and includes training. You know, we didn't have a lot, very little bone health was discussed in internal medicine training until just the last yeah. decade. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to our Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds on a Thursday. So for all sports fans out there, uh, happy opening day of the baseball season. Very exciting. And it's also Sweet 16 basketball day. So as some people put it, one of the greatest days of the sports calendar is today. And it's also a great day uh, for Grand Rounds and a very important topic. As a reminder, before I get started in the introduction, next week uh, will be a, uh, we've kept you on your toes for Grand Rounds this year. Next year, we will have back to in-person at uh, the College of Nursing first floor. We're going to have a uh, visiting scholar, Dr. Isaka from, um, from uh, Georgetown, I believe, if I'm correct. Yeah, I think she's from Georgetown. But she's coming from the American College of Gastroenterology. And this is a honoring, and this is an award that our GI fellowship is being honored with, with Dr. Talin and Dr. Narayanan, who led the charge in getting this award. That um, that lecture is next week. Um, we won't have any lunch, but again, bring your lunch and bring bring your attention and your best attendance, and we will try to encourage and maybe even do a little RSVP to try to, you know, RSVP uh, informal to try to get a nice crowd of support out there. I'll be out there as well to support our excellent GI division next Thursday. So keep that in mind. Now to today, a uh, very important topic, as I was mentioning with uh, before, so we have Dr. Kushayeva from our division of endocrinology. Dr. Kushayeva is the uh, USF Adult Endocrinology Director, and she's also the director of our Adult Osteoporosis Program. Dr. Kushayeva graduated from the National Medical University in Kiev, Ukraine, and she also got her Doctor of Philosophy at the Institute of Endocrinology and Metabolism, also at Kiev, Ukraine, following an IM residency at Georgetown University. Oh, we just mentioned Georgetown. So yeah, it, it, she got goosebumps, as I mentioned, Georgetown. Yeah. Uh, she went to uh, NIH, the National Institutes of Health, where she did her fellowship in endocrinology. And we were absolutely blessed to have her uh, to have her join us in 2019 here at USF Division of Endocrinology in the roles that I described earlier. And um, she has already done amazing things in her career. She has several book chapters she has already authored. Uh, in books on both clinical imaging for in for endocrinologists and internists and an orthopedic uh, orthopedic book. And she also has numerous uh, numerous research protocols and numerous publications in the field of bone health. So as I mentioned earlier, this is an area we where we all can learn more from. and the uh, her title today is a very important one. Osteo osteoporosis medication switching. So I like the simplicity of the title to catch the eye and get everybody very much attuned to bone health. So Dr. Kushayeva, please take it away. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for your kind words. And it is a honor and a huge pleasure to uh, uh, present the topic in front of you. And today is Doctor's Day. I think this is a double honor for me to present in front of all of you. Congratulations, uh, 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 doctors, with our day. Uh, so, and let me start my presentation. Uh, so let me share my screen and you please let me know if you can see my screen right now. Perfect. Yeah. You can. Perfect. Very good. 
So this is a very uh, a complex topic, but I have chosen this topic because there are a lot of uh, unclear answers, a lot of just expert opinions and not too much information we would like to have in, in our current guidelines on osteoporosis management. So I don't have, I have nothing to disclose and I will, I, I, I built my presentation just on treatment, but, but there are a few slides on osteoporosis. I don't think so. I even needed to present them, but just, just, just a reminder that osteoporosis, as you very well know, this is a silent, painless disease until, until fracture happens. Uh, unfortunately, we are not aware about this disease. This disease is uh, uh, characterized of low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue. And the key point here that because this is a chronic disease, uh, uh, this disease requires a lifelong management. So whom we usually consider for treatment based on our guidelines. So first of all, fragility fracture, especially hip and spine. So we assuming this is osteoporosis, regardless what is um, what DEXA is showing, regardless T score. So if T score of minus 0.5 and below in spine, hip or one third of radius. Or if you have patient with osteopenia, but using a FRAG score, which is a fracture risk assessment tool that is freely available uh, uh, online, you will get 10 year risk probability for major osteoporotic fracture 20% or above, or 10 year probability for hip fracture 3% or above. So you need to discuss treatment with your patient. Also, we have a category uh, 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 that can be defined like a very high risk for fracture. So any patient with osteoporosis is a high risk for fracture, but those people are a very high risk for fracture. And you will see a little bit later why it is important. So who can be considered in this a group of or category of patients. So patients with a recent fracture uh, who had fragility fracture within the past 12 months. Uh, fr patients with fractures who are on approved osteoporosis therapy or who had multiple uh, 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 fractures. Fractures while on uh, medication that can cause known uh, uh, cause for skeletal harm. I'm talking about steroids, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, aromatase inhibitors, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, and so on. So, or when patient has a very low T score, which is minus three or below in any region of interest, or when a FRAG score will show you a very high fracture probability within 10 years, which will be more than 30% for major osteoporotic fractures and more than 4.5% for hip fractures. So what we have currently on the market, again, I, I, I'm talking right now only about first line pharmacotherapy options that we are using are uh, very well known anti-resorptive medications, bisphosphonates, oral IV, aledronate, resedronate, ibadronate, uh, reclast, and denosumab or prolia. We have anabolic medications, which are parathyroid hormone analogs. This is teriparatide or forteo, bone ZT, which is the same teriparatide, or it is PTHRP analog, which is abaloparatide or timulus. And we have a relatively new right now already medication that was uh, uh, approved in 2019 in April, which is romozozumab or Avenity. And this is the medication that can provide anabolic effect and anti-resorptive effect at the same time. So key points on osteoporosis therapy. Uh, so we know that effect of all osteoporosis medications uh, usually will have a plateau or even wanes with long-term treatment. It is true may maybe for all of medications, but possibly except prolia or denosuma based on current literature. Upon discontinuation of osteoporosis medications, the skeletal benefit will be lost. And it's very quickly with all drugs except bisphosphonate. Bisphosphonate effect will win much uh, 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 slowly than if you're talking about other medications like anabolics or 
uh, or, or, or uh, uh, prolia. Uh, there is no single treatment approach for patients with osteoporosis, and optimal management usually should be uh, uh, tailored for each particular patient and involve the sequential use of different classes of osteoporosis medications. And only recently we started talking about kind of like a proper sequencing of those medications, correct? Like uh, before the anti-resorptive medications were number one in all of guidelines, right now we have concept treat to target uh, so when anabolic medications will be proposed to be used first and we will talk about this as well a little bit later uh, so what you should take uh, what it would be great to take into consideration before you're thinking about uh, switching a uh, patient from the uh, current osteoporosis medication so you need to know what exactly patient has been used before and for how long each will make a difference and you will uh, 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 see uh, uh, a couple of slides later so any contraindications um, uh, for the medication that you are going to use right now or any side effects that patient might had in the past for exactly the same medication or this group of medication. Uh, uh, so um, age of the patient, history of medication non-compliance because some medications like Prolia should be given every six months without any delay in treatment. And if you see that patient was missing already, I don't know, oral bisphosphonates or maybe IV, uh, IV reclast infusion. So the question, will the person uh, follow with your every six months prescription for prolia? Of course, can patient physically do uh, uh, some treatment like presence of tremor, muscle weakness, residual neurological defect that can preclude or affect self-injections? Maybe patient has a good family support who will be doing this if this medication like, like PTH analog that should be injected every day is the best option for the patient. We need to talk to the family. Can do they uh, help here? Any dental procedure that is pending or is going to be done very soon uh, before you switch to, to, to a new medication. And what will be the next medication after this one you are going to switch patient to? Uh, uh, so also very important to tailor your treatment to the patient's routine. For example, patients who are traveling frequently, uh, let's say with long stay out of Florida, our uh, winter birds, uh, job-related traveling, let's say uh, truck drivers, uh, and also let's say if patient, people who are traveling a lot, for them it's very difficult to keep uh, conditions uh, how to uh, 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 store the medication. Let's say Forteo needs, or Teriparatite, needs refrigeration between 36 and 46 at all times, even after you uh, uh, started the pen. When we are talking about Tilos, which is Abalaparatite, you should keep uh, this pen until you started using this at the same conditions like Forteo. But whenever you started using uh, this pen, you can store this pen up to 30 days, which is exactly uh, how many days this pen is for, between 68 and 77. Maybe it will be more reasonable, reasonable for people who are traveling. Uh, also, key point to consider here, here we are coming, coming to this treat to target uh, strategy. So if your patient's bone mineral density uh, is very low or you need a very quick uh, uh, increase in bone mineral density, let's say before a uh, patient is going to have spinal surgery, orthopedic surgery or any bone related surgery, uh, you might need to remember that only anabolic me uh, medications restore the microarchitecture, that is osteoporosis. Only anabolic medications will result in larger and faster increase in bone mineral density when we are comparing with anti-resorptive medications. So if you need this effect as soon as possible. Uh, bone mineral density will respond to anabolic medication uh, um, uh, uh, to the less degree if the patient was on anti-resorptive medications before. So you kind of like alleviate effect of uh, anabolics uh, when given after uh, anti-resorptive medication. If compare with you give uh, uh, um, uh, um, anabolic frost and then you consolidate anabolics with anti-resorptive medications. 
Uh, also, uh, strong evidence exists for fracture risk reduction with uh, osteoanabolic therapy as an initial drug. And it is clear, the better your bone mineral density is, the lower your risk uh, for a fracture. So the effect of fracture risk uh, 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 of giving osteoanabolic after anti-resorptive, it's still not clear. Uh, so, and also we know that anabolic medications, especially teriparatide and romozozumab, because they investigated more, uh, have been shown to be superior to oral bisphosphonates in improving bone mineral density and reducing fracture risk. So this is a busy slide, but we will go slow here because some medications uh, can be not on the table at all. And how you see which medication you really can even propose to the patient. Let's start and let me let me use a laser. OK, so let's start with bisphosphonates. So and, you know, majority of our osteoporosis patients, they are elderly people, you know, and they might have a lot of comorbidities. And if your patient does not have an ability to stay upright for 30, 60 minutes, or have any uh, esophageal structural esophageal abnormalities that might delay uh, uh, tablet transit, uh, might have GI malabsorption, uh, whichever because of IBD, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, whichever, uh, uh, or have kidney function with GFR less than 30 or 35, depends on medication, uh, or for IV reclast, uh, 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 it should be less than 35. So bisphosphonates are not the best option for the patient. So, okay, now denosumab. If you have a patient, denosumab usually tolerated very well. And denosumab usually uh, doesn't have too much contraindications or warnings uh, to start, except uh, uh, known severe hypocalcemia, especially in patients with CKD. So what you need to do, you just need to check calcium level, vitamin D level, and to normalize everything before you start patient on prolia or denosumab. So, uh, anabolics, abaloparatide, teriparatide, when they are not recommended. So high risk for osteosarcoma, Paget disease, unexplained elevation of alkaline phosphatase, do work up here, just prove this is not bone related. Pediatric and young adults with open epiphysis, this is also interesting uh, point here because we know that epiphysis are, are closing in the different time uh, through our uh, young, young uh, uh, adult life. So also prior external beam or implant radiation therapy that is involving the skeleton. People with bone metastasis, people with history of skeletal malignancies, uh, hypercalcemic disorders, and also, also, it is a difference between teriparatite and abaloparatite. Uh, recently, two-year limitation for the lifetime use was removed from Forteo, but it's still present for uh, uh, team loss. So it means if the patient was on team loss for 24 months already, so you cannot continue team loss. You can consider Forteo, but you cannot continue team loss. So now, Romozozumab, what is a vanity? So here we have a warning box uh, based on Federal Drug Administration. Even it's still not very clear, but people who had this medication can 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 cause uh, uh, has been shown to have increased risk of cardiovascular complications. Again, it's still debatable, but but it is not definitely recommended for patients who had stroke or heart attack within previous 12 months. I also usually for high risk uh, 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 cardiac patients, I usually request a uh, 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 cardiac clearance to start on this medication. So, OK, now critical point. Everything except bisphosphonates, everything, denosumab, teriparatite, abaloparatite, romozozumab, everything should be consolidated with bisphosphonates after you done with uh, 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 the frost therapy. Uh, so, and let's start with bisphosphonates. So, you know those medications for a very long time. Uh, so they inhibit remodeling, bone remodeling, and they usually, they have very high affinity to bone hydroxyapatite crystals. So, and they preferentially incorporate into the sites of active bone remodeling. That is how they decrease remodeling 
and improve bone mineral density. They also undergo recycling. Uh, so that is how, at least partially, we can explain a uh, long half-life in the bone tissue for bisphosphonates. And the higher affinity, the higher, uh, 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 the longer time the bisphosphonate will stay in the in the bone tissue. So, but but as I mentioned before, there is no improvement in trabecular microarchitecture with bisphosphonate, and bone mineral density will increase over the first three, five years of therapy. But beyond this time, beyond five years, no additional increase, at least in hip bone mineral density, has been observed. And here we are facing the situation when patient has increased risk of atypical femoral fracture. And you can see the uh, 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 incidence uh, uh, of uh, uh, AFF. Let's say if patient was on any bisphosphonate for uh, less than five years, it's about 16 per 100,000 person years, and it will significantly increase to 113 per 100,000 person years if the patient is on bisphosphonate or any anti-resorptive treatment uh, for more than, uh, 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 sorry, bisphosphonates for more than eight to 10 years. So, okay. Uh, key points for bisphosphonate use and justification why we might think to switch those medications to something else. Because there is no justification to use them for more than five years, at least right now, for patients with who, who had already improved bone mineral density and right now they are at moderate fracture risk. Maybe they are not a candidate for treatment anymore at this time and just uh, uh, stopping the treatment, going to a drug holiday with monitoring bone mineral density every two years. Uh, so this is a better option. And you can restart therapy again when the patient will meet the criteria. Let's say when bone turnover markers, especially CTX, will go up, when bone mineral density will start uh, decreasing, or patient will have a fragility fracture. Also, the patient uh, um, uh, in this situation, when patient is already uh, has been already on three five years of bisphosphonate therapy, and there is no incremental benefit to continue, but you still need to to treat this high risk uh, 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 for uh, uh, fracture. You can switch to either prolia or to osteoanabolic agent. So, and we will discuss about this again later. Drug holiday concept. It is uh, 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 um, does not pertain to any other medications except bisphosphonate use. Okay, so now this is again. I, I I was trying to put a lot of information here. That is why I'm trying to explain every single paragraph here just for you to have a, a good picture. I mean, as good as I could do this picture. So to 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 have an idea what to do with with medications. So let's uh, 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 assume that your patient is on bisphosphonate and you need to transition the patient to another more potent bisphosphonate or to prolia. Let's see what will happen when we will compare switching aledronate, which is for some of the most commonly used bisphosphonate, to denosumab. And when we compare this effect, when we switch in aledronate to zolidronic acid, which is reclass, so this first group will have a greater suppression of bone turnover markers. Among all, among all of anti-resorptive medications, prolia is the most potent one. And again, we will talk in more details a little bit uh, later. Now, when we are uh, comparing the same two groups, switching aledronate to prolia versus switching aledronate to reclast, and you can see increasing bone mineral density in all sites. Look, whenever you switch into denosumab or prolia, you will have more gain in bone mineral density if you, you will switch to another bisphosphonate. Especially you can see a good difference in the lumbar spine, uh, total hip and femoral neck. So we also can consider, let's say, switching from bisphosphonate to uh, to raloxifen. 
uh, raloxifen is the second line for for uh, 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 osteoporosis management when the patient cannot tolerate or or cannot use any other medications. It's much much weaker anti-resorptive medication, and of course, if compared just with patients who were staying on aledronate, of course, people who switch to raloxifen will have higher uh, bone uh, uh, turnover markers if compared with group that was uh, just on bisphosphonate. So let's move forward. This is transitioning from one anti-resorptive to another. If you can do, if you really need to uh, uh, continue improving bone mineral density, looks like prolia or denosumab might be a better option here. Now, let's talk about denosumab because this is, I think, the most critical medication when we are talking about stopping, switching, consolidation, and so on. So, uh, denosumab uh, is a um, RANCL inhibitor, which is receptor activator of uh, nuclear fa factor kappa B. So, RANCL is expressed by osteoblastic stromal cells and Rankel is absolutely required for osteoclast uh, maturation, uh, 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 fusion, uh, functioning. That is why inhibition of this binding rankle to rank will lead to inhibition of osteoclastic function. And in this way, we will decrease bone resorption or slow down bone resorption and will increase bone mineral density. So, in contrast to bisphosphonate, of course, denosumab is not associated with bone tissue and is highly specific to circulating RANCO. Uh, so, it is not cleared by, by kidneys, so it can be given the most important, what is uh, versus bisphosphonate, that have uh, 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 um, limitations in patients with CKD, dialysis, and stational disease. So, denosumab can be given to this category of people. So, okay, now, uh, this is what we all need to remember. Unfortunately, time to time, we see patients who just stop taking prolia by themselves, or they moved from a different state, or they changed the provider, so whatever happened. So, and here I would like to show you, based on uh, C-peptide level and changes in bone mineral density in lumbar and total hip, what will happen after prolia stopped without any consolidation. So you can see this pink area. This is when prolia has been stopped without any consolidation. Look here, the CTX level, very suppressed, which is absolutely expected with prolia, and then prolia was stopped. And look, already in a couple of months, you will have increased in CTX level significantly. The same will happen with uh, bone mineral density. So patient was on prolia, then prolia was stopped, and patient will start losing and basically will lose everything due, what, what they gained during the next 12 months without any treatment. And this is exactly the same situation for lumbar spine and for total hip. But, oh, okay, and the biggest problem we have with, with prolia, why it should be consolidated, this is a rebound phenomenon. And this is a rebound activation of resorption like you just saw on the level, uh, uh, CTX levels, that can cause even vertebral compression fractures, and those fractures usually multiple. So, and how we can explain this rebound phenomenon? At least a couple of explanations exist right now. Because after especially prolonged inhibition of osteoclast maturation, differentiation, we have increased pool of precursors precursors of osteoclasts and recycled osteoclasts. We call them osteomorphs. And the next slide will show you how they look because those are quite new, newly described cells. So, and this is a intermediate cell population of the osteoclast lineage that uh, is formed by osteoclast fusion. And this is kind of like alternative fate to apoptosis, but osteoclasts are not dying. They kind of like in this dormant 
uh, situation and they can rapidly refuse when there is enough runkle available and it will be available if uh, prolia has been stopped without any consolidation so it means you will have right away a lot of newly uh, maturated fused osteoclasts that will start resorbing the bone correct also, increased runcle will affect uh, runcle osteoprotegerin, which, which is our protector from bone resorption ratio. And also, because of long term, especially long term uh, um, uh, 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 prolia use, we have inhibition, resorption, and formation, correct? Because this is a coupled process. So it means we will have initially decreased number of osteocytes and osteoblast that can counteract this increased uh, 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 resorption of the bone. And this is a publication that explained the situation with those osteomorphs. So you can see in the center, this is beautiful multinuclear uh, uh, osteoclast. And to uh, mature like this, so we need runcle. So, and when it is a fusion process, so basically we will have a lot of, uh, a lot of osteomorphs, but and the effect of runcle and low level of osteoprotegerin, they will fuse again and they will form again fully functional uh, osteoclast. So osteomorphs have been found in blood and bone marrow, so they can travel to other parts of the skeleton. And because denosumab blocks runcle, uh, so, and this runcle will need, as I just mentioned, to uh, transform those osteomorphs back to, to osteoclasts. So this is a new theory. Now, but what you're going to do, correct? Let's say your patient is on denosumab and you need to stop denosumab for any reason. There is a very good just just uh, recent publication just a couple of years ago uh, that was uh, devoted just, just to this question, how to stop prolia. So first of all, there are a group of patients that maybe prolia should be never considered as, as, as a uh, first line of treatment, like young patients with low risk for fractures. So now the next two conditions. So when patient is on prolia, it's very critically to, uh, critical to know how long the patient has been on prolia because the shorter duration of patient being on prolia uh, it's a little bit easy to prevent this rebound activation of resorption. And it has been shown in a couple of publications that if patient is on prolia for less than 2.5 years, you can even switch to oral bisphosphonates for one, two years or to give zolidronic acid for one, two years depending on revaluation and bone turnover markers will be very important, will be very important here. Uh, so I'm sorry about this. Uh, so, uh, so, but if your patient is on prolia for more than two, five, two, point, uh, two and a half years, and we have a lot of patients like this, so what you and what you are going to do here? And we have two options here. So we can just continue the nozomap up, up to up to ten years because we have the safety data. But usually, usually uh, 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 prolia tolerated very well. So, or if you need to stop prolia, so you will switch to zoledronate, that is weaker anti-resorptive medication. And because it is not as potent as prolia, the expert opinion right now, it's still not in the current guidelines, so to measure CTX in three months and six months after you gave uh, uh, zoledronic acid. So it means, let's say your last denosumab was six months ago, you gave zolidronic acid and you are measuring uh, uh, baseline CTX three months and six months CTX. And if you see that CTX is trending up above geometric mean for premenopausal women, you can consider the second infusion of zolidronic acid in six months. Okay, the question, what I'm going to do if I don't have a, a chance to check CTX? They recommend just to give two infusions of zolidronic acid uh, for those patients. 
also remember that prolia is the most potent medication and uh, a vanity or omozozumab anti-resorptive effect of this medication might also not be enough uh, uh, after prolonged use of denozumab to suppress uh, 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 rebound uh, uh, phenomenon. Okay, just one slide about bone turnover markers because many people, we, we still, it's still not so widely used, maybe except bone clinics. So uh, first of all, not all of insurance plans are covering uh, bone turnover markers. And another point here, we still have a lot of questions here how to use them, but at least something that we can say at least based on current knowledge. So the most commonly used two, this is P1 and P, which is a uh, um, um, uh, formation marker, and CTX, which is a uh, resorption marker. Usually those two are used in majority of clinical trials. When bone turnover markers are not extremely useful, again, some experts can, can, can argue with this. So, but... Uh, they are not useful for diagnosis of osteoporosis. Of course, they are not. So, uh, because they can fluctuate. So, also, they are not very useful for uh, individual prediction of bone loss, fracture, or uh, 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 rare complications like osteonecrosis of the jaw, or let's say a typical femoral fracture. But they really can be quite useful in elucidating pharmacodynamics and effect of your osteoporosis medications, especially medication, especially if you're using, if uh, you are monitoring for therapy. Let's say you have a patient who is on whatever, bisphosphonate, correct? Especially oral. And you don't see any improvement. It's okay, one year, two year, no improvement. You can check CTX and to see if it is really suppressed. Maybe your bisphosphonate just not very well absorbed. So it means patient is not getting real treatment. And this is a good time to switch the patient for injectable, infusible medication. Okay, so now when we let's go back to denosumab, to prolia. Usually, stopping denosumab is associated with rebound increase in those markers in about eight to nine months after the last dose. Uh, uh, the earliest time when uh, multiple vertebral fractures have been described for discontinuation of prolia without consolidation was eight months after the last dose. So it, it can be as soon as uh, eight months after the last dose. So that is why measurement of bone turnover markers after three months and six months when you started bisphosphonate therapy, uh, just to confirm that suppression is still enough. And when we are talking about target, so some publications uh, um, guiding us to use premenopausal, premenopausal geometric mean, which is for CTX 320. In one of our guidelines, you will see number 280, but again, they are very, very close. So this is basically around 300. Uh, so, um, and in this situation, if you see that this number is trending up above uh, postmenopausal geometric mean, maybe this is a good time to give the second infusion of zolidronic acid. Uh, so, um, and you should discuss, I usually at least, I, I'm trying usually to discuss all of those uh, uh, details about denosumab before I start this medication. I love this medication. It's very good, very potent, very effective, but you need to tell everything about every single medication you're going to use. What is expected a bone gain? Of course, it's just, just speculation. You cannot tell how much this particular patient will gain and what is the health conditions that around uh, uh, here. Uh, but it's better to explain that this medication should be followed with something. So at least they know that before they make a decision to stop, they need to let you know. Okay, so now, unfortunately, it can happen. So when, when uh, uh, um, uh, suppression is not enough after prolia has been stopped and patient developed vertebral fractures, what are you going to do in this situation, correct? So you have a couple of options here. First of all, we need to avoid vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, and we need to avoid monotherapy with PTH analogs. I'm talking about teriparatide right now. We don't have data, solid data on abaloparatide. So you can 
reinitiate denosumab as soon as possible. You can treat again with bisphosphonate, depends on the situation, so uh, IV or oral, or you can consider combination of denosumab and teriparatide. But this is a very good combination. But I doubt that too many insurance companies will approve too expensive medications at the same time to be given to the patient. So, and key points here, if your patient developed vertebral compression fractures and they were on prolia, you need to uh, quickly counteract the increased bone turnover. And because prolia is a very potent medication and can suppress bone turnover markers really within days, within days, sometimes, I mean, I have patients who have undetectable CTX. I don't know how it's possible, but undetectable CTX. Uh, so um, it means you can quickly restart prolia uh, so, uh, unfortunately, restarting prolia does not fully obliterate the risk of further vertebral fractures. And if you go with the, with bisphosphonates, you will need to keep those patients at least one year before using bone-forming agents. I'm talking about anabolics, and I will show you numbers uh, uh, a little bit later. What will happen if you switch denosumab to uh, 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 Avenity or omozozumab or denosumab to PTH analogs? Okay. This is one of the most important slides, I think. It's a little bit uh, busy, but let's go like sentence by sentence. When you decide to stop denosumab, again, this publication was done uh, on denosumab just for 12 months. So if your patient was on denosumab and you are switching to romo romozozumab, you will have increased spine bone mineral density and you will keep uh, in a good shape your hip bone mineral density. But look what will happen if you switch prolia to teriparatide. You will have a transient bone loss almost everywhere. And for patients who are already very high risk and already have quite low bone mineral density, it might increase risk for fractures. But look what will happen if you will switch teriparatide to prolia. You will increase bone mineral density everywhere, and you will see numbers later. So you can see the difference that denosumab to teriparatide, it's not a good idea. But teriparatide to denosumab, this is a good idea. The same situation with bisphosphonate users, but at least for three years. So when you are switching them to a vanity or omozozumab, you will increase bone mineral density everywhere. Of course, not to the same degree, like you would just start patients on romozozumab, like initial te therapy, but it still will go up. And look what will happen after you switch uh, bisphosphonates to teriparatide. Yes, you still increase bone mineral density in the spine, but you will decrease bone mineral density in hip. So, uh, it means switching from bisphosphonates to teriparatide should be done with caution, especially for patients at high risk of hip fractures. We need to remember this. And right now, this is an explanation why. Look, we are talking about here about patients who were on bisphosphonates for at least three years, okay? And then they were switched. Uh, this blue color means they were switched to romozozumab and uh, red color, they were switched to teriparatide, okay? And the first graph is total hip, then femoral neck, then lumbar spine. And look what will happen. With romozozumab, after three years of bisphosphonate use, you will have bone mineral density still trending down. The same situation everywhere, the same situation everywhere in hip and spine. But look what will happen with teriparatide. So the bone mineral density will decrease in total hip, in femoral neck. It will go up in, in lumbar spine, not to the degree like with romozozuma, but it still will go. And now why? Because... This is an absolutely different effect of uh, teriparatide on trabecular, on trabecular and cortical bones. We know that spine is the mostly trabecular bone, correct? And you can see that both romozozumab and teriparatide will work well on the trabecular bone. But when we are talking about hip, especially femoral neck, so it is mostly cortical bone. 
And if uh, romozozumab works well on cortical bone, uh, a teriparatide will increase cortical porosity and will cause uh, a decrease in, in, in the bone mineral density here. So now numbers, numbers I promised. Okay, so we are talking about patients who were on the nozumab for 24, sorry, it's a typo, 24 months, and they were switched to teriparatide for 24 months. And now you will see what will happen. Lumbar spine, the first month, it will be a decrease in bone mineral density. So it will, but 48 months net effect still will be quite good. And increase on the nozumab only will be about 40, uh, for, uh, about 5%. All of other stuff will be on, on teriparatide. And we know why, because it is a trabecular bone, correct? So now when we are talking about total hip, it's progressively decreasing in bone mineral density uh, between 24 and 36 months. This is exactly time you started patients on teriparatide. And what will be the net effect after transitioning? It will be negative, even most likely not significant, but negative. Femoral neck, transient bone loss between 24 and six months with net effect of 5% increase for the last year. So that is why after the transitioning from the, uh, uh, so if you transition, it, it's, it's like a critical point to remember. Uh, in some patients, when you transition in from the nozubab to forte or teriparatide, the rate of bone remodeling might be even greater if you absorb if, uh, 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 than you absorbed with the nozumab discontinuation alone. So that is how we can explain all of uh, those results. So it means direct transition of prolia to PTH analogs uh, is not recommended at least at this time. So now, now this is the same story, but we are talking about bisphosphonates they that will be switched to teriparatide. Look uh, on numbers. And here we are comparing uh, 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 patients who were naive for teriparatide and who were pretreated with bisphosphonates, okay? So let's say lumbar spine. Look, bisphosphonate naive patients. So it means they just started on, on teriparatide. Look on this amazing increase in bone mineral density. It's a little bit more than 15%. But if you, your patient was on bisphosphonate, the effect will be not bad, but not as, as impressive as in naive patients. With femoral neck, exactly the same situation. Look, 5% increase in naive group and just 2% in bisphosphonate pretreated group. Total hip, here a bad situation. We have in naive group, we have, I mean, not significant decrease in, in, in total hip uh, in six months because, again, this is a cortical porosity. And then it will significantly increase in 12 and 18 and 24 months in total hip. But if we are talking about pretreated group, so the BMD will decrease from baseline and then it will be non-significant increase in 24 months because it, so so it will be basically no significant effect in bisphosphonate pretreated population. So that is why sequencing of medications is very important. You can see uh, uh, how much difference you can make just starting anabolic frost and then consolidating with, with anti-resorptive medication. Okay, let's talk about anabolics. We have two of them right now. So I, uh, so I did not include in this slide avenity because avenity a little bit different. But teriparatide, abaloparatide. Both are working through PTH receptors. Both are forming structurally similar bone to bone from younger people. So the only difference between them, PTH, uh, uh, Forteo is PTH analog, abaloparatide is PTH related protein analog. And abaloparatide has a little bit less pronounced activation effect on osteoclasts. So because uh, PTH analogs, they will stimulate formation, slightly stimulate resorption with a good net effect of, of uh, increased formation, but abaloparatide has weaker effect on, on the resorption. 
So, and you know very well, it was two year limitation for Forteo and Teamless. It's still, it, it, it's still for Teamless, but not for Forteo. So it means you can use Forteo longer uh, before thinking about switching. So how you decide uh, who really can use Forteo for a longer time. And just recently, a couple of years ago, it was a fantastic publication from uh, very well known experts in, in uh, osteoporosis management, and they gave a very good recommendations who might benefit from long term teriparatite use. Okay, very high risk fracture, people who cannot stop steroids, please continue for tell if, if, if you can. High risk fracture in people who still have bone formation marker elevated even two years after teriparatite use, because we think if P1 and P is still on the same level or higher, it means teriparatite is still working. So also high risk, high fracture risk with multiple vertebral compression fractures before and people who, and, and if they stopped fracturing when you started them on Forteo. I have a couple of patients right now and one of them on Forteo already four years. And he, I mean, he basically doesn't have spine. So I even will not know if he might develop any compression fractures because all of them are basically fractured. So, but, Everything is going so well, no progression in fractures, and he's on Forteo for four years. Uh, so at this point, so also a dynamic renal bone disease, because those people, they have a very low bone turnover, very low bone formation, poor osteoid development, and using teriparatide for a long time longer time in those people, they can respond to treatment and at least uh, 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 keeping the same bone mineral density, if not improving. And this is group of patients with COPD. So we know that each vertebral fracture in this category of patients, especially those who already have low vital capacity, so each additional vertebral fracture will cause loss of 8% of vital capacity. So it means those people just cannot afford uh, any additional loss of vital capacity and you can justify uh, for TAO use in this category of patients. Okay, now, now this is amazing effect when you start people on teriparatide and then what is anabolic and then you move to anti-resorptive. So Look, 24 months of teriparatide, 24 months of denosumab. And look at results, lumbar spine, 48 months increase, 18%. And eight of them because of anti-resorptive and approximately 10 uh, previous because of anabolic. Total hip, 6.6 .6 increase uh, total uh, for 48 months with uh, close to 5% being on denosumab. And the same in femoral neck, which will be close to 8% net effect in, in 48 months. When you are using anabolic as a number one and then consolidate with anti-resorptive medication. So key points here that the therapies that produce the largest increase in bone mineral density are clearly associated with the greatest reduction in fracture risk. So it means if you have a high risk a fracture patient, think about this sequencing. In osteoporosis treatment, naive patients starting with anabolics uh, uh, and then transitioning to anti-resorptive will give you a greatest uh, uh, gains in bone mineral density. In contrast, if you uh, initially treat patients with bisphosphonates or denosumab, it can diminish the effect of subse subsequent uh, bone uh, forming agents. Uh, also, as I already mentioned, switching from bisphosphonates to teriparatide should be done uh, with caution. And you remember those slides because it can uh, uh, significantly affect risk uh, of hip fractures. Okay. Now let's move to romozozumab. Romozozumab is a unique medication on the market because it has two uh, 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 features. Uh, it will increase bone formation uh, through bone modeling process 
and it will suppress bone resorption. So this is monoclonal antibody against sclerostin. And sclerostin is inhibitor of VNT pathway that is a forming pathway, bone forming pathway. So basically this is inhibition of inhibition, correct? You will inhibit sclerostin and sclerostin will not inhibit your VNT pathway and the uh, patient will start forming the bone. So, um, uh, elimination very similar to uh, prolia. So the role of hepatic and renal excretion is really very minor for this medication. And look here the difference. I was thinking this slide might be very useful just for general understanding what is the difference between three anabolic medications. You can see romozozumab, abaloparatide, teriparatide. This is formation, this is resorption, and uh, basically bone remodeling. So romozozumab will inhibit bone resorption and will stimulate formation because of bone modeling. Usually this is how our bones are growing. So usually bone modeling is stimulated by mechanical forces exerted on the skeleton. So when we are talking about abaloparatite and teriparatite, they uh, stimulate both processes. And you can see that teriparatite has a little bit more pronounced effect on resorption if compared with abaloparatite. So, but you see a difference between PTH analogs and uh, avenity or romozozumab. So now, uh, now switching Romozozumab to denosumab. You just saw a miracle with switching uh, Forteo to, 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 to Prolia, to anti-resorptive. So this is uh, Romozozumab to denosumab. So just 12 months of Romozozumab followed by 12 and then 24 months of denosumab. So you can see three numbers here. This is the first number is gain of uh, bone mineral density after Romozozumab. The second number after 12 months of prolia or denosumab. And the last one, 24 months of prolia. Look, lumbar spine, 13, almost 17, 18. It's amazing. It's basically exactly the same what we saw uh, for teriparatide that was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, followed by, by denosumab. So total HIP, 6, 8.5, and 9.4. This is amazing result. And the same with femoral neck. So you can see another example how anabolic as a first medication uh, uh, will do a great job when followed by anti-resorptive, but not vice versa. Okay, so here I will ask you to look first on those two graphs. This is effect on bone mineral density of romozozumab if you are treating Romo naive patients, this is a blue bar. Then, if you are treating patients with Romozozumab after aledronate, and the last green bar, when you treat patients with Romo after denosumab, you clearly can see the difference, correct? The more potent anti-resorptive medication was given before the less, bone, the less bone mineral density gain you will receive by the end of treatment. And this is the same for lumbar spine, and this is the same for total hip. You can see. So the best response you will see in romozozumab are naive patients. And here you can see, this is just very interesting comparison. What is the difference between in, in uh, bone mineral density if you do prolia for 12 months followed by romozozumab for 12 months? And we compare this if you give romozozumab for 12 years, uh, tw sorry, 12 months, followed by denosumab for 12 months. Look at those numbers. When you give anti-resorptive first, it still will be a good increase in spine. Uh, 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 after uh, um, denosumab, romozozumab uh, combination. It's almost 12%. But look, if you do this vice versa, it's almost 17%. So the same situation with total hip, almost 4% if you started with anti-resorptive and moved to anabolic, but it's 8.5% if you do this vice versa. And the same with femoral neck. 
So 3% versus 7%. So the idea here that anabolic medications, if you can, uh, and no contraindications should be started first uh, to treat osteoporosis. Okay, so, and this is my last slide with key points I would like to mention that in osteoporosis treatment of the naive patients, starting with anabolic medication and then transitioning to anti-resorptive will provide the greatest gain in bone mineral density and, of course, will decrease risk for fractures more significantly. Prior treatment with bisphosphonate or denosumab can diminish efficacy of bone-forming medications. Also, PTH analog associated bone loss, uh, 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 um, bone formation, sorry, is largely remodeling based. If you remember from that slide when we comparing, we were comparing uh, three anabolic medications. So that is why uh, uh, the effect likely, if, if you are given initially anti-resorptive and then follow with, with PTH analogs, because anti-resorptives also work in, uh, on remodeling process, that is how you can significantly most likely diminish effect of PTH analogs. What is not as significant with Romozozumab uh, that can be given after uh, 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 anti-resorptives because romozozumab is working through bone modeling, not through bone remodeling process. Okay, so denosumab discontinu discontinuation always requires con consolidation treatment. Uh, transition to teriparatide should be avoided uh, because you know that it will lead to accelerated bone remodeling, rapid bone loss until the point of vertebral compression fractures. And of course, if you can, even it is not recommended, plan ahead uh, uh, how you are going to switch medications. Because if you see a patient with very low bone mineral density, unlikely one medication will be enough. Then because osteoporosis is lifelong disease with lifelong management, so it's a good idea at least to have plan what are you going to do. Of course, those plans can change based on the health situation, but at least you will have an idea uh, 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 what might be your next medication uh, for this particular patient. So, and I think I'm done here. I know maybe it was a lot. This is my cell phone. This is my email. Please, please, uh, 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 I will be ready to answer any questions. And you can call me, you can email me. I will be more than happy. Dr. Ledford, why don't we start with you? Uh, I, thank you, but um, that was an excellent review. It was fascinating. I, I had a lot, several questions that we don't have time, but I, I was just curious. Currently, in my experience, insurance companies will not cover newer agents until you try bisphosphonates, and it sounds like that's exactly the opposite of what we're we're doing. That we should be doing the other. And so, I was curious of whether payers are going to recognize that this is the strategy we should should use, meaning bisphosphonates after uh, um, uh, anabolic agents. And the second is, do bisphosphonates work better if you start them before the bone density loss? Say you're entering menopause, why not start it immediately and not wait for a dro drop in bone density? Or when you're starting the corticosteroid, start it immediately, and, and it, it will be more effective because you're blocking the the loss of bone rather than trying to undo what's already happened. Uh, uh, Dr. Ledford, I completely agree agree with you. So I usually prepare whichever letter of necessities. I'm talking to insurance companies just to approve uh, 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 anabolics. Also, also, we have a good option right now. Uh, I'm sure you know about this, that our TGH outpatient pharmacy has low price program and Fortel included there. So it means if patient uh, uh, will be qualified based on their criteria, the patient will receive for Teo, and by the way, and Avenity as well, something like four months per month or uh, per month, four dollars per month or ten dollars per three months, something like this. But I already have five patients like this, so I was not able to go through insurance. I'm doing this through Tampa General Pharmacy. Uh, so can you, can you send some to the VA, please? I would appreciate that. <laughs> the VA pharmacy does not have the same deal. 
So, uh, so we are lucky that Champa General does the same with insulin, the same with a lot of other medications. And this is a very good point that you uh, 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 raised with transition into menopausal period, because we are losing the most bone mineral density, like around this last menopausal period, like a couple of years before and a couple of years of after, before everything will go to plateau. And sometimes when I see that patient is already with low bone mineral density, I'm giving prophylactic doses. Also, the same situation with steroids you know that patient is going to be i don't know on high dose of steroids and you know that patient will lose bone mineral density while why why should we wait until they start breaking bones correct so yes i'm doing this the same with with let's say spinal cord injury this is very debatable people are uh, so uh, uh, some people just not starting any medications after spinal cord in cord injury but you know that they will start losing bone mineral density very quickly as as especially during the first 12 months. So maybe it's better to prevent this. I agree completely. Dr. Shiroki? I had a question about bisphosphonate switching. So I've run into a few um, older women who've developed microscopic colitis that, dis that stopped, the diarrhea stopped when we stopped their bisphosphonate. So they had the colonoscopy, it was biopsy proven. Then we stopped it, their diarrhea resolved. And one of the issues I've run into is, can I put them on zolindronic acid or is it likely to have the same side effect and do they have to go over to Prolia or another agent? Oh, usually this is one group and side effects might be very similar. But in this situation, your concern is clear because you know uh, how old the patient is? The one that comes to mind right now, she's 83, but she's like a she's like a easily could make it to 183. <laughs> Oh, I see. Okay, I see. I see. I see. Because whenever you start the nosumab, of course, at some point, if you decide to stop, you will need to go with bisphosphonates, correct? Uh, uh, so uh, um, I think the prolia would be really a better option here. That is what I would do, maybe. Okay, thank you. And again, anytime you can call, you can text, whichever I know I will share with you. Dr. Ledford had a few other questions in chat. What I'm going to do is email them to you. Okay. So you can correspond with him. Okay. Okay. All right. I think that's it for today. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can get in touch directly with um, Dr. Kushayeva or um, through me if you'd like. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.